you look at uh, the sources for gold around the world, uh, about 30% came from the Witwatersrand Basin. Maybe half of the rest comes from origenic gold systems, these systems where the gold is, is formed during a collisional process. So orogenic deposits basically form in places where you have two plates colliding together. You know, as oftentimes one subducts under another. Orogenic gold systems are ultimately mountain building events and, and these type of uh, systems have deep geological roots. This is a, a crack in the rock after the rock was formed and fluid, hot water came through there and the hot water had dissolved elements in it. And the water flowed through and then gradually this hot water cooled down and it precipitated out that quartz material. And that's what you're looking at in central Newfoundland. It also generates lots of heat, obviously and uh, that heat can drive these systems. It can, it can actually drive the waters inside the ground, scavenge gold, and then force those waters upward through cracks and stuff to produce these deposits. In Fosterville, they, they started to do uh, mining on one. And the grades were, were reasonable grades until Quinton Henning came along and, and with some of his research realized, hey, in certain places you get these little shoots and within those shoots, the gold grade was phenomenal. Oftentimes those principal structures are actually the ones that, that are too confined, they're under too much pressure for those fluids to come up. But those structures in turn create small secondary structures around them that do open up. Those secondary structures are the ones that the fluids usually exploit. The fossil the line and then the, the subordinate structures on it are actually off of a principal structure called the Reedsdale structure. Didn't allow fluids up, but boy, those little secondary structures that came off of it, yep, those were the ones that host mineralization. They were starting to see 10 plus gram, 20 plus gram, you know, 100 plus gram in many places. And I was thoroughly convinced as soon as I saw it, they have found one of these very rare but very uh, prolific epizonal deposits. An epizonal orogenic system is basically uh, a system that formed in relatively shallow depths uh, within the Earth's crust, two, three kilometers below surface. We have just a precious few examples really of, of these types of systems, but boy, when when you find them, you want to take note, you want to take mental note of what you're seeing. What's interesting with regard to newfound gold and the Appleton linear particularly, and even the JBP linear, is there's been a recognition of similarities with the Fosterville area in Australia. And this way the mineralization has been developed in what they call an epizonal area. That was not recognized until just recently. That's how we geologists work. I mean, we like to develop models. We like to explain how the gold got there. So uh, the initial work is this looks like Fosterville. This is great, or it might look like some other one. We find analogs, and we use those analogs to help define what exploration will do in the future. I was on a trip with Craig Roberts and Colin Cattell. We were actually in Nevada. We were in Reno. They said, you know something about Fossil, don't you? And I said, yeah. Uh, they whipped out their telephone and started showing me photographs of core pictures. How on earth did these guys get pictures of Fosterville core? And then they, they told me where it was from. And I said, it's like, holy smoke, you know, uh, let's, let's get on a plane and go see it. So we, we literally uh, booked plane uh, flights up to, to Gander. And uh, within a couple of days, and Gander looking at core that, in my view, was almost identical to core that was uh, on the absolute opposite pole of the earth. One of the things I noticed, vugs. There were little cavities in the quartz vein material. Like you could see these little cavities. It looked like little geodes where there's quartz crystals growing into it. The core from the Queensway project had vugs, just like those that I saw at Fosterville. The gold that's deposited in this regime, in this shallow environment, is very fine grain. Okay, the gold's literally just precipitating out very rapidly out of solution. It's forming little specks all through the quartz. 
right? And that's another trait of the mineralization at, at Queensway that tells me it's epizonal. Same stuff was seen at, at Foston. Uh, you also get other elements. Antimony is a particular element that forms in these environments. Okay, so it's seeing in the case of Fosterville, there's a mineral called stibnite, which is antimony sulfide, and then seeing bolandrite, which is an antimony lead sulfide at Queensway, told me we were in a high antimony environment. Lastly, banding in the quartz. There's nice uh, rhythmic banding in places. When you start to see that, it tells you there were many pulses of fluid going through these cracks in the ground telltale signs of an epizonal gold system, just like phosphor. Here we have very favorable geology. We've got all the right conditions. We've got some models that fit for what gold deposits should be there. So the sky's the limit. What makes Queensway so special from the others, obviously, is a high grade. Why is it high grade? Well, it formed in that epizonal environment, the shallowest environment uh, within the systems. Newfound's project, uh, you have the Appleton Fault, which is a, a big shear zone or structural corridor. Very, you know, a lot of movement, a lot of tension, a lot of compression. The fluids didn't want to go up that so much. Most of the fluid activity is on the secondary structures. What I've got is in a sort of eclectic uh, group of rocks here. This particular one shows a little fault. So you can demonstrate to people what the Appleton Linear is like. People sometimes don't understand how rocks can move. But obviously this was a quartz vein here, which has been moved by this thing here, and then quartz has filled that little fracture afterwards. On a big scale, that's what happens on things like the Appleton Fault. It's the same type of situation. There's been movement along the fault. When you get movement, you get fluid flow. The ones that have been found to date, like the Keats and the Lotto Zone, broke open, and they broke open such to allow fluids to come up and deposit this high-grade gold mineralization. So if we apply that model here, the potential is huge for us to have three or four or five of these chutes, three or four or five of these mines. Some of these structures could be two kilometers deep. These types of systems, they have a huge vertical profile. They can go down a long way. These are probably the deepest rooted gold systems on Earth, to be frank. But this epizonal part, man, this is where the, the absolute best ore forms. The company is targeting some, some of its drilling program down to vertical depths of roughly 500 meters. If we compare that to other gold camps in the world, I mean, certainly Fosterville's down several thousand feet. These things, think of them like a giant knife blade or something like this. Like, they'll go down in the ground for a long, long way. We're basically following that path. The fluids came up, okay? The fluids had to come from somewhere. Now that we understand the system, we're following that path down into the ground. Newfound really had a first mover advantage. Lotto looks like it's a replication of the heat zone. The amount of gold you're seeing is not typical of ore grade, it's high grade. These holes are some of the best that have been drilled in the gold mining industry and exploration for many years.